Alrighty, so <clears throat> my name uh, is Josh Westgard, and I'm a systems librarian at uh, the University of Maryland in College Park. And over the past, I would say now a good five years or more, actually more like six years, um, we have been in the process of standing up a whole new repository infrastructure. And um, that's been a long process, taking a long time, but it's, you know, partly, I guess that can be explained by resource constraints that are on us, uh, that are always in place in libraries. Um, and also the complexity of what we're trying to do um, and the complexity of the data that we're trying to migrate uh, into these new systems. So one major milestone that we've recently achieved has been, um, it's actually happening <laughs> As, as I speak, the, um, the application is um, in final testing for production release. Um, is, is essentially um, this um, administrative interface for our repository system called Archelon. And so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Uh, okay, so a little bit of background, uh, back in around 2015, 2016, somewhere in there, we kind of reached a fork in the road uh, in our decision-making process. So we were evaluating uh, Fedora 4, looking at, you know, we, we've been Fedora users since, um, for almost 10 years at that point, um, since 2006 or so um, at the University of Maryland, but we were still on Fedora 2, actually. Uh, and we were looking at just skipping over Fedora 3 completely and going directly to 4 when that had been released. And so we kind of reached a fork in the road where we had to make a decision. And that was, are we going to do what we did with our original Fedora, which was build our own uh, application on top of it, or were we going to try to go with a community solution? And in spite of all the conventional wisdom that would tell you you should pick either Sambera or Islandora, um, we went through a long decision-making process and eventually came around to the idea that we couldn't do either of those. Um, there were, you know, uh, Islandora Claw at that point was still in its infancy, so that, that was an issue for us with Islandora. Um, with Samvera, there was a lot of uh, flux in that community right at that point as Samvera was trying to get up to speed with Fedora and it just neither of those seemed to be the right solution for us at that moment. And so uh, we, we ended up going with uh, the third option, which was neither and meant building our own architecture. So when we started out, uh, we, one of our first um, decisions we made was that we were gonna put the repository first. That was always what we were interested in was we wanted a front end and a, and a back end for our Fedora. We didn't want a digital collection interface that might or might not be Fedora, that might work with something else, or, you know, Fedora wasn't for us just a database, it was actually what we were building for. And uh, so we wanted to build something that's repository centric. Um, and um, we ended up, uh, one of our first decisions was to um, decide, uh, you know, how we are going to get uh, our collections into Fedora and we thought um, let's just see what it takes to build a, a command line tool uh, that will interface with the API since the, the you know Fedora now had a, had a well-defined uh, specified API that we could work with and so we built this thing called Plastron um, and just by way of explanation for that name um, all of our architectural pieces that we're building have a turtle theme because the turtle is the, the diamondback terrapin is the mascot of the University of Maryland. So a plastron is actually the underbelly of a turtle. And so the plastron tool is the command line tool for loading stuff. Basically it's a client, a, a Fedora API client, LDP, client that uh, allows us to put things into Fedora. Um, and we built with that um, actually two, two um, 
collections in Fedora without actually having a back end that we could manage the content. We, we simply had this tool we could put the collections in. So we, we did NDNP, National Digital Newspaper Program Newspapers. Um, and also we did a correspondence collection called the Catherine M. Forner Correspondence with Her Family. Uh, and um, we did that totally with this command line tool and then building a front end that would display the content for the public. Uh, but we knew in the long run we would need a back-end tool as well so that we could manage content uh, in a better way, and that's where Archelon comes in. So Archelon is the name of a prehistoric giant turtle, and so that's our application for um, our what we consider to be our gigantic repository. Um, and Archelon is interesting. Uh, the approach ended up being that we would use actually the Plastron command line tool and run it in, in daemon mode on a server so that whether you're, you're ingesting into the repository uh, through the command line or through the application, you're, you're essentially using the same software. Um, and uh, so that's, that's the approach that was taken. Um, Archelon also makes use of Blacklight uh, for its search capability and browsing. Um, and it interfaces with a IIIF server. We're currently using Loris, but actually looking at um, switching over to Cantaloupe um, and uses Mir a Mirador-based uh, viewer for display. So um, let's talk about some of the features that we built into Archelon. So one of the features we wanted was first of all, the ability to export data. So we thought, um, this may seem backward that we built export, kind of focus on export first, but the idea was that um, we weren't going to be focused on a GUI um, item editor, um, although we did end up building an interface for that eventually, but that wasn't gonna be our first priority. So we needed a way to get data that we had ingested through those big collections that we had done out so that we could do batch editing on that in a spreadsheet. So the, the approach was to build an exporter that would take the RDF and essentially um, dump it out into a CSV file. And there's challenges to that because of course RDF to CSV is not necessarily straightforward um, mapping, but CSV was considered to be a kind of a requirement um, because um, you know, we work in libraries and of course we can't have things in the spreadsheet. Where would we be? So um, getting, getting things into CSV um, and getting them out of Fedora, we, we built the option to have uh, including binaries with that and also um, it also bags up the content if you have binaries. So um, you can include the images or you cannot include the images if you just want to do some metadata updates. And, um, and it'll bag it up for you. And um, basically it, it dumps it in, onto a server and then you can download that with SFTP. Um, that, that choice there was not to have it come through the GUI itself as a download directly because often these jobs take a long time and um, there was really no reason why it had to be an instantaneous thing or you wanted people to wait. And also the files can get very large as you can imagine if you're, if you're bagging up a large collection. So we use instead a job queue uh, for that. So you kick off your export and it's working. You can go back and check the progress. And then when it's ready, you're able to, to get a download of that. Um, we then moved on to building an importer. So once we get data out, we could do, um, uh, you know, getting the data back in after it's been edited. And um, the thinking was that um, we would start first of all with the workflow for bulk updating. So basically you're gonna download a spreadsheet that has all your metadata, make the changes that you need to make and then upload that spreadsheet and it will uh, you know, edit all of those in one go, all those items. So it makes a very convenient workflow for uh, people who are working on a collection where you can, you can work a lot faster if you're in a spreadsheet and you're making those bulk changes. Um, and so that, um, that was part of, the, part of the thinking. And then we're actually using that same workflow to also now ingest new collections. So 
once we had the model defined for what those objects look like when they come out in the spreadsheet, we could use that same model to say, okay, now here's a bunch of things that don't exist in, in the repository and they're, they're gonna be created by that Plastron daemon in the background. Um, and so it uses that same workflow. It's just, if there's a URI, a Fedora URI present, it will update, try to update and if that column's not there, then it will, it will be a new import. Okay. And then finally, we did add an editing interface. So this was less important for us. So we wanted to actually get away from uh, one-off um, editing, um, but obviously it is something that's very convenient to have. If you have just um, you know, a quick typo that you see or something, you don't wanna have to do a bulk, like a, this whole export process and then uh, re-importing re it. So we do have an edit editing feature, but it's really just for editing existing objects, not for creating new ones. So if you've ever looked at the, you know, the, the requirements of that kind of interface in a GUI to create these objects, you know, that that's a lot of work, um, particularly since we were building it ourselves. And so that was really not a requirement that we thought we needed to to make very high on our list. So it's really editing just existing items. Um, you can do things like add another instance of a predicate. So there's a nice um, feature for say, if you have multiple creators, you can just add another one. Um, and uh, you can do things like modified language tags. So that was a thing that that's, that's an important thing for us because we do have multilingual collections. So you, you're able to, um, add those data types and language tags and things to fields that in the editing interface. So um, actually, you know, I, I don't take uh, advice very well. I don't follow <laughs> best practices, I guess. And I'm going to actually do a live demo or going to attempt to do one. So uh, let me just switch my screen up a little bit here. One second. Okay, I hope you're seeing now um, actually the, um, the application interface. So um, <clears throat> this is actually running on our development server. So um, please excuse any weird things that you see in the data here because this is kind of just, um, uh, this is just a dev server, um, not the production um, thing. So but before, I, before I actually show you that, I just wanna show you what we built. I, just so I can show you kind of the, the more fancy things. Um, I'll show you what we built with the, in our original um, work with just using the front end and the Plastron loader. Um, we did this newspaper. So I have a search here, can search I'm doing for flu and some nice features here. You can see it's a, it's a black light uh, interface um, or black light like, this is actually happening in our library website CMS. Um, so um, you can click on the item, you get your Mirador viewer, uh, thumbnails take a little bit to load up, but then um, we actually have things like uh, hit highlighting here. So I search for flu and you see that it's uh, telling me where flu is on that page. So we're really able to do a lot, I think, with that. Um, and then um, here's the Kathnam Porter. So for our friends in SCSI FUG, I put in Texas as the uh, search term because Kathleen Porter was a Texan. Uh, and you can look at her letters. And again, you get the same interface. So I think we were pretty proud and pr pretty successful just with Fedora, this command line tool, and then our website front end. But um, now I'll show you what we've been working on lately. Um, so this is Arcalon. Uh, as it says here, it's the administrative interface for our Fedora 4 content repository, soon to be hopefully Fedora 6. Uh, we, we probably are going to skip over five. Um, and um, so you can see here, you can actually view some of those same collections. So here we can look at uh, Kathnam Porter correspondence. You get a similar interface, but you have other features such as edit metadata. So here's the editing interface. I can click on that and you see here 
the kind of complexity that happens even with pretty simple metadata, right? So you do get, um, you know, RDF does, um, does make things a little more complex. There's a trade-off with having it be sort of world, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, sort of universally uh, intelligible kind of metadata system. Um, there is some, some cost to that. And so it's a complex uh, bit of a layout here. You could do things like um, you can add a second identifier if you want. Um, you can add URIs right here. You can add a URI for this um, in addition to a, a label. Um, you've got um, yeah, some optional fields down here that are pointing to BIAF. So it's, there's quite a lot going on in that. Um, let me just go back um, and I'll show you how the import export works. I do have a few minutes, right? I, uh, we started at 20, so yeah, I have a few minutes yet. Uh, so, um, so I'll look at the uh, import job queue. So um, this is some testing going on and we have some failures. So I am showing here kind of the dirty laundry, if you will. Um, but um, you see here, this is a queue for the job. So you get a job ID. And then if you want to create a new job, you can click on the button. You, uh, the job is assigned to a person. So you, you can have, we, we expect we'll have many users using this. And so they'll be, um, you know, each able to create their own jobs in the queue. Um, and you, we have different content models at work here. Um, the issue content model is the newspaper one. The letters are the Kathy Ann Porter correspondence. And posters is actually another collection that I didn't show you, which is um, uh, for our Prang collection, which is a Japanese language uh, collection of um, things published in Japan in the post-war period. Um, so you can choose choose which content model you're going to import under and then item is actually the generic one that should work with kind of just your basic page content essentially um, um, just as an aside i should point out that we're not intending to do audio and video in this application uh, because audio and video are very important uh, to the university of maryland we have a lot large uh, broadcasting collections uh, but we're intending to actually go with Avalon Media System for that side of it because we don't want to have to reinvent that wheel, um, basically. So we're going to be using Archelon together with Avalon in kind of in parallel. Uh, and so the item is just really all the paged content. So whether it be a, a simple photograph, which we, we understand as being a one page document, basically, or a book that might have hundreds of pages. Um, and you're going to use item for that. You can set your uh, access uh, levels here. Basically, we just have the two right now, public or just campus only. Uh, we don't have it, uh, the facility to ingest the um, totally private stuff at this moment. Um, you can uh, select your collection that it should belong to. And then you, you give a CSV file, um, which has the metadata according to that um, schema that we set up um, and then you can you can um, select a set of binaries that go with that CSV and so you have to SFTP your binaries over to the server before you do the load because doing it you know through the GUI is going to really be um, not performance so um, we we have an SFTP Dropbox essentially this feature was inspired by how Avalon does it uh, you have this Dropbox uh, location on the server. You um, transfer your files um, over into that ahead of time, and then they're visible here in this list. And so you can uh, select the one that you want to use. Uh, the, the export queue is very similar. Um, basically, you're going to, uh, first you're going to find the items and you use the selection feature. So I don't have any items selected. So if I went to uh, went to search, say I went Dimeback Photos and I wanna choose this. Uh, actually, I need to just click select, right? I select, uh, oh, there might be a bug there actually. <laughs> There's a live demo at work for you. So I should have a selection box. Oh, select all searchers. 
Ah, so there's a problem there. Let me do a different search. Okay, yeah, something is wrong with that other screen that's not displaying this box. So if I wanted to export this item, now I have one selected item. So now I can kick off an export for that item here. And I can do these two different formats. You can do the CSV file or you can actually export it as turtle. And it will create the create the, the job for you. And then you can select which binaries, uh, which types of binaries you want to include for the item. So um, you know, if it's J, if it's just for a researcher, you could give them JPEGs, they're gonna be smaller. If they want for reproduction purposes, you might need to do the TIFFs. Those are the preservation master files. And then we have OCR files that are plain text. And uh, for the um, newspaper project, we do have XML files as well. So that, that's basically the export. And we've already seen, the, already seen the editing interface. I've shown that. So I think that's actually everything I wanted to demo. And I do have, I think, uh, five minutes or so still for questions. So I think I'll stop there and uh, be happy to take questions. So there's a question from Mark. Um, the newspapers look like they are segmented to the article level. Is that correct? That is correct, yeah. So uh, we, ha we digitized those to the National Digital Newspaper Program standard. And we did, I think that doesn't require the, OC the article level segmentation, but it's like an option that's a known thing. And we went ahead and did that. Um, and so, yeah, so you get basically text blocks on the page um, that are auto recognized as being, a, you know, a kind of a unified block of something. And it might not be the whole article, right? So those blocks can, you know, an article can obviously be on multiple pages and can like jump from one place to another. And so there's no way to, uh, without some manual, I think, work, there's no way to like reconcile all of that. So it just goes by the text block. And so you're getting your hit highlighting and you get that block also that it's in highlighted. And then that you can actually download the text of, or you can view the, the text of that whole block. Um, and you can actually do a, a snippet. So like here, it's, it is highlighting like this text block. And that's not the whole article. Um, but you can, if I go to full screen, oh, can you still see that? <laughs> but it's yeah, that sharing. comes through. Yeah. Uh, so I have a, the image clipper here. So now I'm going to, uh, I don't know if you're seeing that, but basically I'm, I'm highlighting a block and I can, uh, you know, refine it to get what I want. And then I click the check and it will pop up a download. You probably don't see that, but a little download thing popped up uh, where I could then save that little JPEG from that uh, clipping. So that's a nice feature, but yes, they are, go, they do go by um, text block. And obviously we have word coordinates in there to facilitate the hit highlighting. <laughs> 